सो काफी बातें तो शबाज खोसा साहब कर चुके हैं लीगल मैटर्स के ऊपर केसेस के ऊपर और अलीमा खान ने आपको खान साहब के पैगाम दे दिए और उनकी अपडेट्स दे दी और प्रिजनर्स और उनका उनकी जो रिहेबिलिटेशन का काम जारी है उसके बारे में भी उन्होंने काफी कुछ बता दिया आई थिंक कि मैं आपको एज अ प्रिजनर थोड़ा सा आज अपने पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंस के बारे में बात करूंगी कि मेरे लिए ये जर्नी क्या थी और मेरे साथ क्या हुआ इससे आप लोगों को अभी भी कई खातन तीन चार खातन अभी भी जेल के अंदर हैं और ऑब्वियसली दे वर अराउंड सेवेंटी फोर वेमेन हु वेंट टू प्रजन टू कोर्ट लक पर जेल एंड माशाला से ऑल ऑफ दैम आर आउट नाउ ऑन बेल और लेकिन अभी भी हम लोग सारे जेल ट्रायल्स का सामना कर रहे हैं बट मैं आपको थोड़ा सा अपने पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंसिस के बारे में आज बताऊंगी Uh, मैंने कुछ लिखा हुआ था एंड आई थिंक क्योंकि अब वी हैव यू नो सॉर्ट ऑफ शॉर्टेज ऑफ टाइम सो आई विल राधर देन स्पीकिंग सॉर्ट ऑफ एक्स टेम्पो आई विल जस्ट रीड इट आउट टू यू आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक यू फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी टू स्पीक टूडे फर्स्ट एंड फॉर मोस्ट आई एम खदीजा शाह अ पाकिस्तानी एंड अमेरिकन ड्यूल सिटीजन आई हैव बिल्ट अ लाइफ इन माई मदर लैंड पाकिस्तान एंड आई एम एन ऑन्ट्रप्रन आई ओन एंड हैड टू फैशन ब्रांड्स एंड हैव रिप्रेजेंटेड पाकिस्तान ग्लोबली My grandfather was the former chief of army staff and my father Salman Shah has served as the finance minister of the country. I have always taken my civic role seriously and spoken up on various issues affecting our country and the well-being of our people. On May 9th, I participated in the protest against Imran Khan's arrest, the subversion of our constitution and the derailment of democracy as an ordinary citizen of Pakistan. Over the next few days I started receiving phone calls that I was in danger and should leave home. I was shocked and in disbelief. I had done nothing illegal. Why was I in danger? There were news there was news of raids on the houses of people who had attended the protest and my name was on a list. I was I had to leave home with my daughter. A few days later armed men raided my parents house in Kant and abducted my father husband and my brother my father who had a history of service to the country is a diabetic and needs his medicine in the early hours he was not allowed the courtesy of even taking his medication my husband was beaten he was tasered and his eardrum was permanently damaged they had come to get me My sister sent me a video of the raid and asked me to leave my friend's house immediately. They had our drivers and our household staff. It was only a matter of time before they would get to me. I left my 5-year-old daughter sleeping. I would see her face again after 2 months. The next few days I went from house to house. Whoever would be kind enough to give me refuge. I stayed in empty homes and took public transport. A family was scattered all over the city communicating with each other without revealing locations. I was completely alone. After a week we decided that I would surrender myself to the authorities. My face was being flashed all over media as a PTI leader and the mastermind of the May 9th protest. A narrative was being drummed up painting me as an absconder on the run. False news of my arrest would be broken. placing me at locations i had never been to i would be i would see all this on tv and social media certain journalists were tasked to spread the same narrative on social media and certain accounts were calling for my rape by the police and skinning me alive it was the most terrifying thing to see about yourself and it was being done without an iota of proof being given against me they wrote and said whatever they wanted to pin on me with such conviction and no one questioned where the proof was this was my first personal experience of complete lawlessness that had engulfed our country and would swallow it up on in the months to come my husband was still in jail without any charges and they refused to let him go till i handed myself over my family was shattered and scattered my friends homes were being raided The staff was getting beaten and brutalized. I decided to surrender. I still believed against my instinct that I because I was innocent and there was no proof the courts of justice would release me. As I drove in a rickshaw to the CCPO office, 
every instinct of mine told me the grave danger I was in. There were several points at which I thought, just stop, get out of this vehicle and run far away. Those tweets of propaganda and political accounts asking for my rape and skinning me alive flashed in my head. I just told myself, whatever would happen, Allah would give me the courage to bear it. I numbed my mind as I would seven months later on the journey to Balochistan. I surrendered and I was thrown into a dirty cell in Lytton police station with street criminals. The next morning, I was pre presented like a terrorist with a black shroud over my head at the ATC, and the judge sent me to KL Jail, Lahore. That's Kotlakpur Jail. I would remain there for the next seven months. In these seven months, I saw our judicial system exposed to its rotten core. There was no law, no process, and no justice. After hundreds of hearings, adjournment after adjournment, eventual denial of bails from the ATC, and five different cases leveled against me, I finally got bail from the High Court, and I was subsequently detained under an NPO. An NPO is an archaic colonial times ordinance, which was used against the local populations to restrict them from demanding independence. As my NPO neared its completion, I was whisked off to Balochistan through the back door of Kotlakpur jail, as my family waited at the High Court for my release after seven long months of imprisonment. The order for me to be taken to Balochistan was sanctioned by an ATC judge. There was no consideration of the merit of this ludicrous demand. No consideration that I was a woman who had already suffered illegal incarceration for seven months without proof or conviction. No consideration of what would happen to me and where they would be taking me. I was put in a Vigo with heavy police contingents and driven to Balochistan on an 18-hour long journey on the most dangerous route in Pakistan, a route where there are almost daily attacks on police and law enforcement agencies. My life and the lives of those tasked to take me were put on stake as if we were animals and mere statistics. I was kept in a basement in a detention center in Balochistan. I was in police remand for 17 days. The charge against me was leading and instigating the protests in Balochistan. The honorable judge of the Balochistan High Court, like all sane individuals, found this to be laughable. The police, even after 17 days, were unable to produce any credible evidence against me. I was finally released on the 27th of December and headed back with my family to Lahore. Up until 9th May, I had led a life of privilege. I never had a brush with law or the legal system. I was outspoken on political matters as a student of politics and a concerned citizen. But I had no idea about the extent of our institutional and systemic deformity. I was brought up by my grandfather, the former chief of the army, and I had seen the leadership of the political parties closely. It is alarming that those same politicians who would flock to my grandfather asking for his intervention and support to bring them into power are still dominating the political landscape 30 years later. My grandfather would be shocked by their demands and repeat vehemently, the army has no role in politics. I grew up with a disdain for our politicians and their lack of concern for the ordinary citizen and selfish pursuit of self-interest and power. I never voted till Imran Khan's party, the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, emerged on the political landscape. Like millions of educated Pakistanis, having had enough of Pakistan's stagnation and the lack of opportunity and progress, I flocked to the PTI. Here was a leader who made our country win the World Cup built the first cancer hospital of Pakistan and had an untarnished record of financial integrity. He stood in stark contrast to our traditional politicians who had only become richer as Pakistanis became poorer over the last seven decades. Imran Khan's government wasn't perfect, but he held the people of Pakistan close to his heart. 
and his greatest initiatives targeted to help the most underprivileged and bring ease to their lives. The PTI performance in KP was unparalleled. However, just three and a half years in, he was ousted by the vote of no confidence, blatantly and visibly orchestrated. His MPs were bribed, collected in the Sindh House and made to vote against him. Murderers of Nazim Jokyo were flown in from Dubai to vote against him. Jailed leaders were escorted to the parliament to vote against him. Pakistanis watched shell-shocked as our fragile democracy was turned into a joke and ripped into shreds. We all know what ensued after. In order for Pakistan to thrive and flourish, we must strive for true democracy, for rule of law and the independence of institutions, for each institution to operate within the ambit of its constitutional provision. There is no country in the world that has, that has advanced under military rule, no matter how well-intentioned the rulers may be. It is up to the people to elect their representatives and to hold them accountable. The people will always vote for their betterment, betterment in a democracy, and in the betterment of the people lies the progress of the nation state and all the institutions within it. Today, lawlessness is unprecedented. Hundreds of innocent people like myself face jail trials even after having been imprisoned for months without conviction. If there had been any law, we would have been charged, given bail as is our constitutional right, tried and convicted or set free based on evidence. This process was fully subverted. We saw rampant political persecution take place in the guise of establishing law and order. Homes were raided without warrants, families were ripped apart, women were thrown into prisons, people were forced to denounce their political allegiance, loyalists of a particular party were forced into hiding or imprisoned, unable to campaign and submit nomination papers for election, and so on and so forth. This is a path to destruction. A country that does not have democracy, rule of law, and an impartial system of justice cannot hope to achieve stability or prosperity. Today, millions of Pakistanis are trying to leave Pakistan. Businesses are shutting down, capital flight is taking place, and there is no investment on the horizon. The, Ch the Chinese, the Saudis, the UAE, and the US are inching away from us. Pakistan is the fifth most populous country in the world, and it is one of the poorest countries in the world. We are ranked 164 out of 193 countries on the Human Development Index. After 32 years of military rule and 45 years of hybrid democracy, Pakistan falls under the low human development category, lower than other South Asian countries including India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Pakistan's GDP per capita stands at $5 a day, which is in stark contrast to the average per capita income of developed countries, which stands at an average of $210 per day. The literacy rate recorded in Pakistan is 59%, while the global literacy rate is above 86%. In Pakistan, a staggering 22 million children between the ages of 5 and 16 are out of school. It is our collective responsibility to set our country back on track, right the wrongs, make a firm commitment to democracy, rule of law, and say absolutely not to the desires of the elites who want to usurp the right to rule and plunder our national resources for personal gain and interest. Even as I have suffered unimaginably and been put through immense pain, I harbor no desire for revenge against anyone. I would never want to see any woman politician go through what I and other PTI women supporters have suffered. I would want no politician, no matter what his party or affiliation, 